Praise God. Good morning, everybody. This morning, I just want to look at the love of God for us. You know, there's so many things happening at this time that are so awkward and so totally different. And so many people are confused. And amongst all this, people wonder, well, what does God think about this all? I just want to remind you that God loves us. And when I say us, I'm talking about the whole of the world. He said, God so loved the world, not just God so loved me, but God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have have everlasting life. I mean, one of the big debates at the moment, and I gather there's going to be a broadcast tomorrow on TV by Boris Johnson, is what will happen at Christmas, because it's not a time of family get-togethers. It's a time when friends get together. And at the moment, there's so much isolation and loneliness and separation of families. And it's breaking so many people's hearts. And... God notices that, and God feels it. And I do want to just talk a little bit about that this morning. You see, in Matthew 18, we read just before the sermon about the parable of the good shepherd. A shepherd notices when there's one missing. Praise God for the 99. But he noticed that one was missing. And so he goes out and he looks for it. And it's easy for us who aren't farmers, or I'm not a farmer, uh, to think of how easy that is. But when you consider the lengths that people have to go to search for a missing sheep, even in Yorkshire, never mind if you're going up and down cliffs like you have in Israel, and up and down um, those sort of hills, with all the crevices and everything. It's, it's a lot of effort. And Jesus is bringing out the fact that God puts a lot of effort into seeking you and me. We may think that we're in hiding. Some people think, well, I can hide from God, like Adam and Eve did. But God spends a lot of time seeking that lost sheep. And then in that same story which Jesus told in Matthew 18, it tells about the joy of finding the lost sheep. You are valuable to God. I am valuable to God. God wants to find us. He wants to save us. He wants to rescue us. In fact, it goes on in that parable. It says that God, our Heavenly Father, doesn't want anyone to perish. You know, some people get angry with God at the moment and blaming God for deaths amongst COVID. And we have to keep foremost in our mind and bring their attention to the fact it was never God's idea that there should be disease in the first place. But more of that later. God doesn't want anyone to perish. And in that parable, Jesus is stating that God our Heavenly Father notices where we are. God, our Heavenly Father, is interested in family relationship. He brings the sheep back to be with the rest. God doesn't want to lose one of his children. He loves each one. And uh, he tells a similar story in Luke chapter 15. It has some slightly different emphasis. The shepherd still notices that somebody's missing, still emphasizes the effort in looking for the one that's missing, but it tells you how he personally goes and puts the sheep on his shoulders and brings it back rejoicing. God is never happier than when he is helping us to come back to the family, to the safety of his fold. He rejoices. And not only that, 
But he tells the others in that story, he says, the shepherd comes back and he tells his neighbours and his friends, rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. There's exceeding joy. And um, he asks them to join him in rejoicing. And he goes on to say that the inhabitants of heaven, God our heavenly father in heaven, rejoice when a lost sheep, when a lost person is restored back to God's family. Why? Because he loves each one. If you're a parent, or even if you're not, I'm sure you can imagine how worried you could get if one of your children was missing. I know when our own daughter was caught up in the tsunami and washed out to sea, and they were hunting for her. And we spent days hunting via the phone to Thailand, trying to find her, to see if she's alive, to see if she was safe. There's that longing to hear those wonderful words. And it was a wonderful day when we did indeed manage to get hold of her and find that, yes, she was terribly injured, terribly bruised and in hospital, but she was alive. And it's great that we can have her back again in the family. I'm sure that people can imagine that, even if you've never had that situation yourself. And that's how God feels about you and I. That sin had swept us out into the sea, away from him, and was taken us away from everything that was good that he planned for our life. And he longed to find us and to bring us back and to give us the very best, because that's what God has for us, the very best. In John uh, chapter 10, verse 11 to 16 that we read, it says that Jesus is the good shepherd, not just a shepherd, but the good one, the one who will stick up for you. You see, he talks about how wolves attack the flock to destroy uh, sheep, to kill the sheep. And how the shepherd, the good shepherd, would even give his own life to defend his sheep. Jesus did just that for you and for me. And for all the people in the whole world, he gave his whole life at the cross to rescue the people from the wolf, from Satan, from sin, from death, the last enemy, as St. Paul points out. And Isaiah points out that it is destroyed, is death itself. And that's what Jesus did when he rose again from the dead. And that's what he'll do at the resurrection of the dead, which is yet to come. And in John chapter 10, it also points out how he wants them to be in one flock. You see, we're, we're in numerous church, churches, numerous situations, numerous lands, but we are all one flock as far as he's concerned, all his family. That's the love of God for us. And then we read in Ecclesiastes, God made everything beautiful in its time. See, one of the things we have to remember is that when God created the heavens and the earth, and he looked at it, and when he created man, in Genesis chapter 1 we read, God saw that everything was good. Even men and women, everything. Everything that existed was good. And that's how God intended it to be. And that's how God intended it to stay. But unfortunately, as we know, mankind chose not to obey God. And we call that the fall. When people rebelled against God and let sin into the world with all its awful destruction, with all the illness it brought with it. But it wasn't God's original intention. Also says in Ecclesiastes 3, God has set eternity in the hearts of men. You see, you and I are eternal beings. Whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, it won't make any difference because God put eternity in you. You are going to continue to exist for eternity, the question is, 
where. And God does not want you outside of paradise. If you remember on the, on the cross, the thief turned to Jesus on the cross and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. That's where God wants to take every single person who's ever been born, who will ever be born. He wants to take them to be in his family because that's where he is. Paradise is the home, the place of the king where everything is good and everything is right. It also says in Ecclesiastes, the people cannot fathom what God has done. No matter how long you spend, you still will not be able to work out everything that God has done and will do. In John chapter 11, we have the record of Jesus coming to the grave of um, Lazarus. And just before he gets there, it says, and Jesus wept. Jesus wept when he met the grieving family of Lazarus. Now remember that if you read the story, you would also know that Jesus knew that Lazarus had died before he got there. You also know that before he got there, Jesus knew that he was going to go and raise him from the dead. So why was he weeping? I, I want to just bring something out possibly for us to consider. As a parent, you don't want nasty things to happen to your children. You love them. You want the very best for them. And that's what God wants for us. Every single person. And so can you imagine, I mean, I would hate it if I heard that one of my children would be injured in a car accident today. I'm sure you would too. I'd hate it if we heard that one of our children was sick. God hated hearing all the terrible things that were going on in the world. He feels it. We do have a high priest, it tells us in the Bible, in heaven, a person, Jesus, who knows how we feel. He was grieved. No wonder he wept. He wept because he saw the distress that people were going through. The distress at losing a loved one. The distress at losing somebody through sickness. You see, Jesus was affected because he is God. God, our Heavenly Father, created us all. In the beginning was the Word, as we had earlier. And without him, nothing exists that does exist. He created us, every single one of us. And he looks out for the best for us. And can you imagine how upset he is when something bad happens to us? Something which he never intended. Terrible experiences were never God's intention for his creation because we are his family. You see, if you think of the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, our father. Our father who art in heaven. So yes, God is in heaven, but he is our father. It's a family God wants us in. He wants to love us as a father. He is our father. We are members of his family. And he is hurt when we are hurt. He was wounded, beaten, bruised, pained. If you remember in Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it be so possible, take this cup away from me. Because the agony of bearing all the terrible things that come upon people were taken to the cross, were laid on Jesus. You see, you and I are eternally loved. God loves us eternally. And as a father, you want to take care of your children. 
You want the very best for them. God, our Heavenly Father, wants to do the same for you and for me. We as parents have the problem sometimes, don't we? We say to children, don't do that, you'll break it. And, oh dear, it snapped, it broke, it's irreparable. And sometimes we can't undo the things which our children do. Even if we want to, their favourite toy. Sometimes terrible things happen and we wish that we could take it back and that it didn't happen. But it has happened. And here in Jesus coming to seek and to save, he offers us a complete new life. A complete new beginning. He came to seek and to save that which was lost, that which was broken. He gave his life that we may have his life. He died in our place. He died to save us from eternal hell, from eternally being outside of God's family. He died to bring us new spiritual birth. Hence he said, you must be born again. And when we receive Jesus into our life, we are born again. We receive again the spirit of God that we can relate to him as father and at the resurrection we even receive a new body it's interesting jesus said and i'm going to read a bit from uh, the today's english version jesus said let not your heart be troubled do not be worried and upset do not be worried and upset. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. We have a message of hope for people who are dying. And there are thousands dying at the moment. And as I said to a minister only last week, you need to tell your father about this. Because... He is dying. We have the message which no one else has. The message of Jesus. The message that will change their eternal destination. That they can go because Jesus is busy preparing a place for us. Every single one. There is room in heaven for every single one. That's why he says, don't, don't be upset. Don't, don't be troubled. I am going to prepare a place for you. Isn't that great? You know, I mean, I'm sure that every one of us at some time or other has been on holiday and you look forward to getting there and you expect it to be all nice and clean, don't you? And all wonderfully prepared. Well, that's what Jesus got. And it's not just a holiday. It's for eternity. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. We are going to the very best place that you could ever go. You cannot go to anywhere better than where God is. It's impossible. He is the best. God is love. He, he is almighty. He is, he is perfect. He is bringing back to us more than what Adam lost in the garden. I am going to prepare a place for you and that I will come back and take you to be with me. That's wonderful, isn't it? We can't arrange that, but he can. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's tremendous. Jesus is coming back again, whether that's when we die, when we leave this earth, physically, or when he comes before people have died. He is coming back again. And all will be raised at the trumpet sound. That's another sermon. 
We need to appreciate afresh what it means to be a member of God's family. It means that we have a father who is all powerful, who is all loving, who really cares for us and wants to talk to us. You know, it hurts you if your children don't talk to you. And sometimes it's difficult to communicate, isn't it? And God wants to communicate to us and with us. And he wants us to tell him the things that are troubling him. You know, you say to your kids, what's the matter? Nothing. Are you all right? Yes. Can you, can you picture us and God? Aren't we sometimes like that? I'm all right. I don't need any help. Well, actually, please help. But pride so often blocks away of asking for help, doesn't it? In the book called Peter, 1 Peter, it says, casting all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. God cares for us. It's one massive family relationship with Almighty God. You can, just imagine that. Not just having me for Christmas, but having God sat at the table too. I mean, it's tremendous, isn't it? We are in a family relationship with God Almighty, sharing with him our perspective. And, and I, I, I'm going to say something which you may or may not have thought of, but God has even given us a little um, glimpse of what the resurrection will be like, of what death and the resurrection will be like. You see, you went to sleep last night and you woke up again this morning. And if you've been on an overnight train or a plane or a boat, You've gone to sleep in one place, like we did in Cyprus, and we woke up in the harbour in Israel. Totally different place, totally different setting, totally different culture. And that is a picture for the Christian at death, which is why Paul talks about that we shall sleep and God will wake us from the dead. That we go to sleep in him, and we wake again in a totally new culture, totally new environment. It's called heaven. It's called the place where God is. And at this time of year, if you've got an old shed in your garden, you may be able to find some chrysalis. That's where the caterpillar has called up, found a little place where it thinks it would be safe, and it's formed a little chrysalis, a little shell around itself. And to all intents and purposes, if you looked at it, it's all shriveled and dead. But at the right time, that chrysalis opens, and out comes, not a caterpillar, but a beautiful body, a beautiful butterfly. And that's what Paul talks about when he compares our body to be in a tent. This is a temporary dwelling place. The best bit is yet to come. And death in, in this sense, I want to compare to the chrysalis. That when we die, we pass from this world into the next and we wake up. And as Paul says, we will have a glorious body. And if you look at some caterpillars, they look pretty grim but I haven't seen an ugly butterfly yet. <laughs> and you and I will have a wonderful new body and we will know each other and there will never be any more sickness, never be any more death, never be any more parting. And there's a wonderful song I, I love by Jim Reeves. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. And he goes on uh, to be in the king's domain where there's no more sickness. No more suffering, no more pain. My friends, in this COVID situation, we need to remember that we are part of God's family. That even though we might feel completely alone, and we might be physically alone, God is there with us to comfort us, to help us. And we should take every opportunity we can 
to help our family members know and experience the blessing of God. And those like Gloria, who my wife mentioned, whose funeral will be taken tomorrow, who have gone to be with the Lord. In her last six weeks, she has just been praising God because she knows where she's going, because she asked Jesus into her life when she was 30 off. And all through her life, she has known the blessing of God. And even though she died, uh, humanly speaking, with that morphine treatment, all the rest of it, she would have been in a terrible uh, pain. But thanks to the, the treatments, she was uh, relieved of most of her pain. But all throughout, she was telling her carers, nurses, and everybody else about the blessings of being a Christian and how she too is going to be in that wonderful new place called heaven. And that one day we'll see her again because we too love Jesus. My friend, if you don't know Jesus and you're watching this this morning, you're missing out. The Good Shepherd is calling to you through me through this video, come home, come home. I was asking somebody this morning, how can I express my comfort to the people at the funeral because I can't cuddle them. And, and, and they said, well, give them a virtual hug and I want to just stretch my arms out now as it were. And that's what Jesus wants to do to you, to give you a hug only his is virtual. He says, come home. You who are weary, come home. Come home to him. Come home to his family. Come back to the life he intended you to have. A life where there's no sickness, no death, no sorrow, no sin, no anger, no drug addiction. It's just wonderful, the life which God offers each one of us. Come home. I want you to pray this prayer with me if you've never prayed it. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Save me. I want to be part of your flock. I want to be part of your body. I want to belong to you. I want to know you as my own Lord and Saviour. Thank you, Jesus, that you're preparing a place for me that one day I will be with you but in the meantime, God is my Heavenly Father and he loves me and helped me to talk to him as a loving father, despite whether I had a good father in this earth experience or not. But to regard him as a good father, somebody who's there to guide me. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He provides for me. He will guide me. Help me to understand, Father, that you love me. God bless you. Amen. Got a hand back to Pastor Patrick.